I want to introduce to you one of my dear friends here at the Wayworld Outreach. This man, if you can believe it or not, was a former gang lord. He rode with some outlaw biker gang back in the day, and his life has been so radically transformed that when he tells you even a bit of his story tonight, you're going to be amazed at what God can do. I love 1 Corinthians 6, 9, it says, that is what some of you were. He has a testimony that will blow your mind because God has taken him from something that the world said could never be used to being a pastor at the Way Road Outreach. He is our campus pastor at Pomona, California. Would you welcome Pastor Chris Morgan? Man, well, first off, can we give it up for your, our senior pastor, Marco Garcia and Pastor Lisa? I just want to say what an honor it, it truly is to be up here again. I don't, I don't get to make it this way very often. I mean, by that, I mean up here very often, but I don't take it lightly. And, uh -oh. I was going to ask if Pomona's in the house, but I guess we know. And my people right there. But again, I want to thank you guys for having me out here tonight. I believe that God has a, a word of encouragement for you tonight. And my prayer is this, that hearts would be open to receive it. That you would be encouraged and that it would strengthen you. And it is important that we know, and as we go through this scripture, how powerful your testimonies are. I'm going to share a couple of things tonight, but let me just jump right in. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. We hand this time over to you. Holy Spirit, have your way. Let this word be an encouragement to the hopeless, to the lost, to the broken, to the depressed to the suicidal, to the addicted, to the bound. I pray tonight, Lord, that this word would show your true power. We thank you, Father, for what you've done in our lives and for what you are going to do in the lives of so many. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Y'all can have a seat. I want to ask you just to, as we're going in, um, I want to ask, is there any cancer survivors in the house today? Come on, can I have you stand up really quickly? Breast cancer, cancer, this is October, this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Come on guys, can we give it up for them? My amazing, beautiful wife is herself a breast cancer survivor. And I've watched God do miracle after miracle, not just in our lives, but even just watching her. My faith grew through the battle that I watched her face. And as we go into these scriptures, I'm going to take you to, maybe you haven't looked at it quite like this, but we are in our, our DG book, and our, D, our daily growth book. And as we go into these scriptures, I, I want, I'm really going to be pulling out something that you might not have thought of. Or maybe you did. But where are my note takers tonight? All right, just by, just by a show of Bibles. Let me see Bibles in the air real quick. I do this at Pomona campus all the time. We're Bible toters, guys. The real deal. Not Bible apps, paperbacks, right? So look at this. We're going to jump right in. So this is in, we're going to go over this scripture and then I'm going to break it down. This is 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 14. So it says, and this is Paul writing to the Corinthian church, and he says, We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble that we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought that we would never live through it. In fact, 
we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely on our, only on God who, raised, who raises from the dead, verse 10. And he did rescue us from mortal danger and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him and he will continue to rescue us. And you are helping us by praying for us. Then many people will give thanks because God has graciously answered many prayers for our safety. Verse 12, we can say with all confidence and a clear conscience that we have lived with a God-given holiness and sincerity in all of our dealings. We have depended on God's grace, not on our own wisdom, human wisdom. That is how we have conducted ourselves before the world and especially towards you. Our, letter, our, our letters have been straightforward and there is nothing written between the lines and nothing you can't understand. I hope someday that you will fully understand us. Even if you don't understand us now, then on the day when the Lord Jesus returns, you will be proud of us in the same way that we are proud of you. I know that's a lot of scripture, and I'm going to do my best to, to break it down. And my prayer was, make it clear, Lord, and don't let me yell. I have a tendency to do that in Pomona. But this, this passage and what, what Paul was describing right here and what he was showing as he opens up was he was telling them about a time that they went through a situation in, in Asia. And, and if you go back and you start studying this, and I won't get too deep into it, but we're believing a lot of this came out of Ephesus where he spent three years and he was planting churches. And there was a particular time, and this is just one, Whereas Paul and his team were out there, man, people were getting converted. They were turning to God. They even had a huge bonfire with all of their, their books and their witchcraft and all these idols that they were worshiping. And they're throwing it in this big pit and it turns into this huge fire. But then, you know, when you start messing with people's money, people start getting funny. Because this was big business in Ephesus. They're selling books, they're selling little statues, or big statues, I don't know how it went. But people are now renouncing these things, so people started to get upset. And what ends up happening is that they're in this big arena with this big bonfire taking place, and then some people, it started to turn it into a riot. They started chanting the idols' names, and they started doing this, and it turned into a big thing that they were telling Paul, you need to get out of here. These people will tear you apart. Paul was facing a time where it could have been death for him. And this is just one time that Paul went through it. I'm telling you, Paul, man, he, if he didn't turn to Christ, he would have been a gangster for real. But he highlights the importance of his reliance on God during difficult times. And the fact that he was comforted in this time. But not only that, that afterward, and this is where we're going with this, that he was comforting others. What is this called when your trial or your difficulty that you go through can turn to comfort others? What's it called? Shout it out. It's called a testimony. Some of you thought it was just for you. Your testimony isn't just for you. Look at this. This is the biblical meaning of testimony, not just the meaning of testimony, like where you go to court and you testify. But this is the biblical meaning of testimony, sharing the story of how someone became a Christian or a specific event in their life when God did something remarkable. How many of you in here can testify that God has done something remarkable in your life? But look at this. Using it to encourage or to uplift another's faith. Before you can share a testimony, I need you to know this. Is you have to recognize that you've been through something. And I don't just mean, maybe for you, your testimony doesn't look like my testimony. But if you've given your life to Christ, I guarantee you, you have a testimony. A lot of times, testimonies 
can have suffering. A lot of times, testimonies can have pain. A lot of times, testimonies can have rejection, loneliness. But as we look at this, I, I want you to know that recognizing and understanding the affliction, the suffering, and the pain that you go through, it's not just for you. When you begin to look at what you're going through, it will begin to change your perspective if you allow it. What do I mean by that? If I begin to look at the things that I am going through, the pain, the hurt, maybe even the rejection of the struggle that I'm going through at the time, and I begin to look at it as this, I don't know how God's going to do it, but he's going to turn this around for my good. It begins to change my perspective. Now I go into this is, okay, what am I going to learn through this time? And who am I going to share this with after? Let's look at what he said as he went through. And this is out of verse 8 and 9. He says, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble that we went through in the providence of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. Has anybody in here ever felt that they were in a position that they felt crushed, that they felt overwhelmed? You thought maybe for some reason, you're like, I can't even deal with this. I feel like I'm going to die. This is the anguish that Paul was feeling. It was in a place where he's all, man, I bet, I, I'm probably better off dead. The way that this feels, I know some of you can relate to this. But he goes on to say, and he says, and we thought that we would never live through it. I know how many of you in here, you never thought you were going to make it through. But here you are, right? He said, in fact, we expected to die. But as a result, say there's a result. We stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises, come on guys. I love how we didn't just say that we relied on God. He said we rely on God who raises the dead. Our God is a God who raises the dead. You think he can't raise your situation back to life? Come on. Somebody's going to get breakthrough tonight. Paul begins discussing the intense hardship that he faced in Asia, describing it as overwhelming beyond his own strength. And I, I want you to get this. You're in a good place. And I know it sounds crazy. But if you're in this place and you feel, man, I'm at my, my wit's end. I feel like I can't go any further I want you to know that you are in the right place. Paul said that God had brought him to the place where he could not handle things on his own. It was his breaking point where he understood he couldn't do it on his own. It was beyond his control. He had to rely on God. Paul's only hope was for God to deliver to get him out of the situation, to get him out of the struggle, to take him and get him out of the pain that he was facing. Again, this is a good place for some of you in here tonight. That place is to be in a, in a space where you acknowledge that you can't go any further. Look at this, in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do, and he will show you which path to take. Understand, family, we need to acknowledge, as believers, we need to acknowledge God. When we begin to do that and we put our trust and we rely on him, only then will he direct your path. 
Some of us right now, we're confused. We don't know which way to go. But the problem isn't that, that you, you don't have a way to go. The problem is that you're not seeking the Lord. Stop leaning on your own understanding. Stop re start relying on God, and he will begin to make a path for you. I want to talk to you about a, a, a story. And I know we, we had a, uh, what a great honor it was to speak at our marriage challenge, uh, me and my wife. Um, how many of you guys were at the marriage challenge? Or advance, I'm sorry, marriage advance. It was an amazing time, and, and we did get to share a little bit of our testimony. And I want to speak about it just for a moment. Um, my wife was diagnosed with um, stage 3A, which the A meant aggressive uh, breast cancer. And it was, uh, they, they gave her a probability. Uh, they gave her an expiration date, almost. They were saying, you know, there's not much we think we could do, but we're going to try. And, it, and, and, you know, my wife, again, this was, I have never seen faith in action like I've seen in my wife. Like, I've never seen it before. My wife's words out of her mouth were, okay, well, it's a win-win. Here's the doctor giving her a, a, you know what, we don't know what we're going to be able to do, but your mortality rate, these are, and they started shooting numbers. And she said, okay. It's a win-win. The doctor said, what? She said, it's a win-win. He's like, I, I don't think you understand. And she's smiling when she's saying this. The doctor goes, I I'm sorry, I don't think you understand what I just said. She goes, no, I understood. But it's a win-win. He says, what does that mean? Either I, either I die and I go to be with the Lord, or I stay here as a testimony to help other people. So as we go through this battle, I mean... I've never seen this kind of faith or strength before in my life. And as we go through this battle, and I say we because those of you who, who have helped and fought alongside of somebody, it's a battle for you too. And as we went through this battle, and she continued to stand on the word of God, it didn't matter what they threw at her. She had multiple major surgeries. The strongest chemotherapy that, that at the time that was ever made, she had extensive radiation. There was all kinds of stuff going on. And she continued the entire time to stand on the faith. And she said, nope, I'm healed in the name of Jesus. Amen. So fast forward, a few years go by, we're fighting, we fought this fight. They were saying, yeah, you're cancer free. You're cancer free. She's like, okay, I knew that. And we didn't like have a big party because we already knew. But then she goes in for a surgery, and her last surgery, and, and they say, oh, it was a 14-hour surgery. They come back, and they say, oh, we found, it looks like the cancer came back. The words that came out of her mouth were amazing. The doctor said, there's not much we can do. If it came back, we have done everything that we can do. We've given you the strongest chemo, all these surgeries. There is no point of us cutting you up anymore, they said. She said, okay. Doctor's like, okay. She's like, yeah. She's all, because where you guys leave off, my God picks up. We need to get into a place. We need to get into a place when you feel that you cannot go any further, understand you are in a good place because where you stop, he picks up. Family, this is an encouragement to somebody. Some of you have been praying for your husband to come. Some of you have been praying for your children. You feel there is nothing more that I can do. You're in a good place because I'm telling you this right now. Begin to give them to God. Begin to understand that it was not your job to do this. You go as far as you can and let him pick it up. Amen? Our end is God's opportunity. Or our end is where God begins. We need to be excited for what's to come. 
We shouldn't look like a bunch of Christians that are moping around. Oh my God, Pastor, I'm going through all of this struggle. I just, it's so much I can't carry it anymore. This is what we look like too often. We have these faces, we have this uncertainty about our situation, about the outcome. Who cares? We know that it's going to be good because our God is in control. Why do us as believers, we get in this place where we start doubting who God is? Some of us continue to try to do things on our own. And the reason a lot of times that we do these things is because we want a specific outcome. We're not trusting that God has a plan and if you would allow him, he will guide you and he will direct you into that plan, into his purpose, into his will. But we can get into a place where, no, but it's got to be this way. So we try to do things on our own. The whole time, God is telling us, let go. Oh, you're fighting for your family. Okay, good job. But don't you trust my timing? I can just vision this, and I know I said this to, to Pomona a few weeks back. I can just envision. Have you, anybody ever watched wrestling? Okay. I used to watch wrestling as a kid. And there, I would see these people, these tag teams, right? I love the tag team matches. And there's this one person. They're getting beat up in the ring. They're stretching their arm out. They're trying to reach. They've got the guy on the sideline. They're out there, they're saying, oh, if I could just touch him, if I could just tag him, he's going to come in. There's my reinforcement. You never see a tag team match where the person just stays in there and stays getting beat up. Oh, I got this as they're getting stomped out. They start to reach their hand out. If some of you today would just begin to reach your hand out, just begin to say, Lord, I'm tagging you in. I can't do this on my own. And then you would see when they finally did touch, all of a sudden that dude jumps over, he jumps in there and he starts wailing on the other one. Yo, wait a minute, is this church? What is this? I'm just saying. The Lord is waiting for you to tag him in. What's the purpose of your struggle? What's the purpose of your pain? I have a couple, I'm just going to give them to you really quickly. Number one, it's to experience God's comfort and build our confidence. In verse 10 and 11, it says, and he did rescue us from the mortal danger and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him and he will continue to rescue us. And you are helping us by praying for us. Then many people will give thanks because God has generously answered so many prayers for our safety. See, Paul speak, is speaking about God's delivering him from his troubles. And, and not only that, he begins to speak of the assurance that he has that he's going to do it again. How many times do we do this? God deliver us from something. He's got us through something. And then the next thing that comes up, all of a sudden we start, oh, I don't know about this one. I know he saved my husband, but I don't know about my kids. I don't know about my sister. I've been praying for. I don't know. Paul was saying he did it before he'll do it again. We need to get into this place, family. If God did it for your knucklehead, oh, I don't want to call your husbands or wives knuckleheads or your children knuckleheads. But if he did it for you, why couldn't he do it for them? telling you right now, I believe anything is possible. If I came to Christ, anything is possible. I'm sure we can all look back and we can all think of a time where God has brought us through. But again, the very next thing that comes up, do you carry the same confidence that whatever you're facing next that he will deliver you or he will get you through it? If we did, we'd have a bunch of head up in the air. We'd look a little 
I would say a little cocky. I don't think that's a bad thing when it comes to our God. This is what it looked like when my wife was going in there. Because she's like, you don't know who my God is. She's, act, she's like, literally, she's acting like, God is all that in a bag of chips. He absolutely is. And, and I'm saying this because when you begin to declare something, I'm going to tell you, our God likes to show off. What people would say is impossible our God loves that. If somebody would just stand up and come against that word that is spoken over your family, spoken over your health, you begin to declare what God has spoken over you. Oh, uh, here we go. The Israelites did this in Exodus. And, and this is after the Israelites had watched God put plagues on Pharaoh God had set them free from Egypt. God even parted the Red Sea. And then shortly after, they start complaining about where they're at. Oh my God, you brought us into the desert so we could die. Did you not just see the ocean open up for you? Some of us are doing the same thing. Did you not see that God made a way for you? that you are sitting in this building with a sound mind, that you are sitting in here instead of a jail cell, that you are sitting in this place. But we get in that place where we start complaining. We have to be careful, family. Oh, he rescued you from so many things and then you come in here and you can be, oh, well, I just don't know. My rent's due. God even gave you a house. It's a miracle that you have a, play, a roof over your head right now. Okay, I don't want to touch too much on that. Calling out complainers. But understand this, complaining starts when you stop acknowledging what the Lord has done for you. Or you even start to downplay it. What I mean by that, when you start to say things like this, when the thing that you were praying for happens and then a little time goes on and then you begin to rationalize and come up with a different scenario of how it actually happened. I've seen people do this a lot. I've been in jail a lot, guys, and uh, not something I'm proud of. I praise the Lord that he delivered me from bars. I'm allergic to them now. But... But I've seen this a lot where people would pray. They have a court date. God, just get me out of jail. They're working with the public defender. Praise the Lord for our public defender's office. You guys are amazing. But, but they're working on this big case and all of a sudden God delivers them and they get out of jail. And the next time I see them, they're back. What happened? Oh, you know, man. And I go, what happened? Oh, that was just my lawyer, really. I go, what happened? I thought you had a, I thought you were praying for this. Oh, well, you know, now nah, maybe it's my lawyer. He, he did a really good job. Or some people who even do, oh, well, you know, I've been praying that I'd be healed from this sickness. And then all of a sudden, and the doctors were even saying there's no cure. And then you get cured. And then you begin to think, oh, well, it was because of this certain medication I was taking. We begin to downplay what God has done in your life. But when you start to do that, it opens the door for you to start complaining about situations. And this is exactly what happened with the Israelites. It's important that we never forget, we never forget that God is the source of our comfort. He's the source of our comfort in a struggle, in our fear, in our doubt, in depression, and in our pain. We are not alone in our suffering. God is always with us and working it out for our good. Look at this in Romans 8, 28. This is in the Amplified. We know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his plan and purpose. God seeks. I mean, seek God's comfort through prayer 
through scripture, worship, and through fellowship, building relationships here. You do these things in difficult times. What happens a lot is we tend to isolate. We tend to go back. We tend to withdraw. But this is how, and I'm going to share a, a, another testimony very quickly. There was a time when a, a dear, dear, dear friend, I grew up with this brother, and, and I came to Christ, and two years later, he was murdered. He was still living in the, in, in the lifestyle, and I was praying. He came to the church. We were on Sierra Way campus. He came once, and he said he was going to come the following Wednesday, but that Sunday, he was murdered. It was difficult as I started like really bringing these things back up and I was sitting there today and I was crying and I'm thanking God for the things that he's gotten me through. And I begin to look at this and it stirs up some emotions. But I begin to look back because even through that, I was growing. It helped me by praying, by seeking God in this time that I began to grow. How was I growing? What was I growing through? In the chaos of my own thoughts, I found peace. In my rage, I learned how to forgive. In my doubt, I learned how to trust. And in my sadness and pain, I found comfort. In John 3, 7, 13, 7, it says, Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing, you do not realize right now, but you will understand later. A lot of times we don't understand it at the moment what we're going through. Why is it us? Why are we going through this and dealing with this hurt and this pain and this rejection, this sadness? Scripture says you don't know what I'm doing right now, but you will. Though the things that me and my wife have been through, I know more now than ever that God has had a plan. In Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, it says, For I know the plans that, and the thoughts that I have for you, says the Lord, plans for peace and well-being and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call on me and you will, and you will call on me and you will come and pray to me and I will hear your voice and I will listen to you. How many of you need God to listen? The beautiful thing about it is he's saying that he's listening. I'm going to jump down and we'll close it out. Number two. Number one was what? Our pain is for what? To experience God's comfort and to build our confidence. The second part is this. Sharing our comfort with others. Paul was sending this letter to the Corinthian church and he says, we can now with all confidence and a clear conscience that we have lived with a God-given holiness and sincerity in all of our dealings. We have depended on God's grace, not on our own human wisdom. That is how we have con uh, conducted ourselves before the world and especially towards you. Our letters have been straightforward and are here. there is nothing written between the lines and nothing you can't understand. I hope someday you will fully understand us. This letter was to allow and to let them know what they were, had been facing, the things that they had overcome. Again, I wouldn't be able to stand up here to speak about just, and these are just like a couple of the testimonies that me and my wife have in the last 11 years since we've been here. But I wouldn't be able to stand up here and talk to you about forgiveness and what it takes to forgive. I wouldn't be able to stand up here to tell you how to overcome fear and how to overcome doubt if I had never been through it. The testimonies I share, I share with conviction because I know, because I've been there and I've done it. Your pastor, where you just don't understand. I do understand. Paul was saying, I understand what it is to go through things. But I rely on God. My last point, we'll leave it here, is God is glorified. It is important that we understand and that we know that through our trials, God is glorified. 
That's why it's important that you don't talk about, you don't murmur, you don't have complaints. I'm not saying that you don't have feelings, but God has given us a way. He's given us community. He's given us his promises. He's given us his word to encourage us and testimonies all across this room to encourage one another. I guarantee you that what you're facing right now is not isolated. There is somebody else in this room that has gone through it too. You guys get a word tonight? Okay. Right now, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up quickly. And I want to pray. But I pray that this word has been an encouragement to you. I'm going to leave you with this last scripture as you're standing. It says 2 Corinthians 4, 15 and 18. It says, all of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be a great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles that we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things that we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. It's important that you know, family, maybe you signed up, you're like, oh, I'm gonna be a Christian. Everything is gonna be perfect. I ask you how that worked out for you. The truth is, family, we're all going to go through struggle. Every single one of us. Now, well, I ain't been through no struggles yet. Don't worry, it's coming. I'm not speaking death. I'm speaking reality here. It's important that you know this. But I want you to know that there is a comforter. And his name is Jesus. I want to call up right now. Altar team, come up really quickly. Right now, if you're dealing with something, if you're going through a struggle, if you're going through a fight right now, and you're saying, I'm at my wits end, I can't take this any further, I want you to run up to this altar right now. We're going to pray with you. We're going to connect you. We're putting this in God's hands. I'm telling you right now, the test, the trial that you're going through right now is going to turn to a testimony. Come up, come up, come up. Give them a hand as they come up. I don't care what it is. You're struggling in relationships. You're struggling with your children. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's a car. Whatever it is, depression, anxiety, addiction, whatever it is, come up quickly. We're believing God is going to move right now. Miracles are going to take place right now. Freedom is taking place right now. Generational curses are being broken right now. Come on. Here's my call. Okay, we're believing change is coming. What you're going through right now is not meant to destroy you. It's meant to encourage you and to uplift you. It is meant to strengthen you as you rely on God. So right now, is there anybody in this place, maybe you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you haven't received him. This is where it starts. Don't be that person, just, what is it called? My, me and my wife always say, 911 Christian. You only call out to God when you need something, and you're in an emergency. That's how he gets you to turn to him. That's amazing. But don't walk away when you get it. Right now, if you're in this place, you say, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I'm going to give you an opportunity right now to receive him as your Lord and as your Savior. You're going to invite him into your life. You're going to begin to see the, his power move. Right now, if that's you, I'm going to count to three. Or maybe you're in this place and maybe you're a backslidden Christian. Maybe you, you knew God. Maybe you, you had a relationship at one time. But maybe you even took off and you sinned right before you got here. I'm not here to point that out. But let's make sure that we get it right before you leave. Don't walk out those doors without making things right with him. 
On the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. If you're in one of those two categories, one, don't let anything hold your hand down, family. If your heart is beating right now, I'm telling you right now, God is speaking to you. This is your moment. Two, three. Show of hands. Anybody right now? I see your hand, sis. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand in the back. I see your hand. Anybody else? Okay, what I want you to do, come up really quickly. All those that raise their hand, come up really quickly. We're just going to pray a prayer really quick. Come up quickly. Ask your neighbor right now. If you want to go up there, I'll go up there with you. All right. I'm proud of each and every one of you. Today we make a stand. This is what we're doing. We're making a stand right here, right now. That fear will no longer control me. That these other things outside of God and God's will for my life will not control me. I love this. Come on, give them a hand as they're coming up. They're still coming. Come on, come on, come on, come on. They're still coming. Right, we got space. We got space. Okay, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Father, forgive me. I know I've sinned. I know I've turned my back on you at times. But today, I make a choice to turn to you, leaving my old life behind. I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die for me, to pay the penalty that I deserved for my sins. And I believe that you raised him back on the third day so that I could have the opportunity to be reconciled to you for eternity. Today I receive the free gift of eternal life that you offer. I receive Jesus as my Lord and as my Savior. Today, I believe I will never be the same. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, amen. All right, God bless you guys. Thank you guys so much for having me out. If there's anybody else that needs prayer, please come up. We'll be praying for you. God bless you.